Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Nice. I didn't mean to interrupt lunch, but we do have a program to run. So thanks for coming. Uh, we're really excited about this. I'm Chris Feeney. I'm the president of the Technology Policy Division at the Financial Services Roundtable. And also as acting CEO, we're really pleased that you could make it. We're thrilled to do the FinTech and innovation work. But importantly for this kind of um, session, it's really important to think about some of the key considerations around policy initiatives, capital investments, workforce, uh, some of the new technologies that are either emerging or here that we really need to talk, to, talk about amongst an entire group. So we're, um, we're really excited about this. As you know, we run this FinTech Policy Series. We also host a FinTech Ideas Festival, which is a CEO-based festival designed for thinking in the five-year-plus horizon. So the real idea is to make sure that we're having the conversation we need to have to be very effective at what we're doing. Um, today, doing as an industry, today we're going to have a number of different speakers that will be uh, exciting on a number of fronts. Uh, we're certainly going to spend a lot of time on some of the newer technologies. We think that's important. Uh, we'll certainly also spend some time on some of those technologies and how they affect us. And a couple of examples might be how data is being used, considered, uh, flown into products that is really changing the way both consumers want to consume information, get services from an industry like ours, but also how the regulatory environment needs to think about it, what types of policies are in place to support either privacy considerations or effective and appropriate use considerations. There are real examples of this industry over time that really speak to the innovation that it has done. Uh, if you think about, you know, faster anything in current format uh, payments, for instance, if you think about automated advice, you think about some of the tools and services that the financial in industry has brought out. You know, I personally, I've, I grew up in that space. I'm a technologist by background and by application, if you will. But we're at a point in time where the promise of fintech and the realization that the customer, the financial needs that they have, the access to, uh, let's say, I'll say capital, but it could be as simple as payments, uh, is really coming together. I think the fintech firms have certainly recognized how important the large firms are. That's because in many respects, that's where the customer lives. However, there are also new markets. There are new places. We're going to talk about in the last panel the digital currencies, for instance, cryptocurrencies, ICOs. Are there alternate markets we need to consider? And if we consider them, how do we consider them responsibly? How do we provide to the consumer what they need, which is fast, cheap, inexpensive, better access to services they need? And how do we do the same thing in a responsible, balanced, effective, collective way? So that's really the format for today. Uh, we're really thrilled to go, go through it. Um, if you think about just some recent advances in the financial space, you have point of sale loans that never existed before in the way that they do today. Uh, collapsing the uh, uh, you know, approval time, if you will, and the access to capital. Um, you know, things like that make a huge difference for how the consumers in our communities, of our businesses, of our nation, really access and take advantage of financial tools. So we're thrilled to be here today. We're going to go through the effects of these um, particular services. Certainly we'll talk about workforce. Uh, as you think about the changing environment I just described in sort of summary form, the workforce needs to come along with that. They need to be able to understand apply, supply, and support those types of services. So it's a really exciting day for us. Uh, I'm going to introduce Allison Hawkins, who is our SVP of Communications. Allison has been behind the FinTech series now for about two and a half years, although it was a thought before that for at least another two. Uh, so we're thrilled to have you. We're really pleased to have some of our fantastic speakers, especially as we start talking about how we apply capital to solving some of these problems, how we apply regulatory thinking to how we uh, you know, solve some of these problems and how we supply policy, effective policy to, su to some of these problems. So thank you all for coming. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. And Allison, you're going to MC for the day, so come on up. Thank you. OK, welcome. We are excited to have everybody here. Uh, first off, how many of you attend FinTech conferences? Raise your hand. Okay, a half of you. All right, um, so sadly with this conference, I don't have the British accent that usually most of the <laughs> MCs have, but uh, I bring the Idaho accent, so hopefully you can take me seriously still. Uh, we are really excited to have you guys here. The format for this event is gonna be a little bit different. We're not gonna do a bunch of traditional panels. Uh, our first group of speakers are going to give uh, kind of a TED-style speech on their ideas on 
uh, the topic that they're speaking on, uh, and then we'll invite them all back up to do some Q&A. Uh, what's gonna make those sections work is audience Q&A. So we are really going to need some interactive audience participation. So as these speakers are uh, giving their uh, thoughts, please feel free to write down any questions you have and be ready to ask some questions for when I invite them all back up uh, uh, for the Q&A portion. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, get right into it. I'll introduce our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is Douglas Merrill, and he's the CEO and co-founder of Zest Finance. Uh, they are an AI company, and they use cutting-edge data science to help corporations execute more accurate credit decisions. Um, he was formerly the CIO at Google. You may have heard of that company. Uh, they, uh, they have an impact on the world. Uh, he was a researcher at the Rand Corporation. Uh, he's also the author of the book, Getting Organized in the Google Era, How to Get Stuff Out of Your Head, Find It When You Need It, and Get It Done Right. I could use that. Uh, and uh, I first came across uh, Douglas and his team at the FinTech Ideas Festival last year, and they just had some really fascinating ideas that they brought to the table. So with that in mind, Douglas Merrill. Thank you. So the, the title of my book uh, was written by a committee uh, of a whole bunch of marketing people and me. I wrote the first part. They wrote the rest. Mine's five words. Theirs is like 20. Uh, so let's, I, my lesson learned, never write by committee. Uh, so I want to talk about machine learning for just a couple minutes. Uh, I'm not going to actually talk about machine learning. I'm not going to present any math or equations or anything, because I don't think that's the point. Mostly what I want to present is a layout of what you should be thinking about when people show up in your offices or in your firms or you read a newspaper article about ML. Uh, what are the questions you should ask? What are the things you should believe or, for that matter, not believe? Let's start with a start with an example. It's always fun to start with something which is pseudo-realistic. Let's pretend, uh, as a group, we wanted to, to build a machine learning model to predict gender. Okay, we're all in the one thing. This is obviously illegal. Let's not do it. But let's pretend we're going to do it. Uh, when you ask someone, hey, you know, how would you predict gender? The first thing people say is height. Right, men tend to be taller than women. Okay, fair enough. The problem is, uh, is it isn't actually that great a filter. There's a woman named Sandy Allen, who's an American, uh, she, she died recently, sadly. She was uh, an American woman who was seven feet, seven inches tall. I mean, I'm pretty tall but that's all tall for me. And there's a dude who's still alive named Dylan Postal. Dylan Postal is four foot two, uh, and he's a professional wrestler. What else would he be? That's so awesome. Uh, he's quite, quite a nice man. He's too short. Okay, so height alone doesn't get you gender. Okay, I, well, I didn't mean height alone. I meant height plus weight, because in general, uh, for given height, men are heavier because we have more muscle mass because of testosterone. Okay, height plus weight pretty much covers the space, except for kids. Kids are now all marked as women because they're too thin, all right? Oh, okay, I gotta handle kids. I'll just add birth date. Now I have a model of height plus weight plus birth date, and I'm pr almost perfect in my predictions. Pretty cool, huh? But I bet if I had taken a survey three minutes ago to say, does age help predict gender, you all would have looked at me like I was an idiot, right? The beauty of machine learning is you can find weird interactions like that and use them to your benefit. ML is very powerful being able to handle different kinds of what are called signals or you know, variables if you prefer, and when you glue them all together, that's awesome. And it turns out that obviously a three signal model is trivial, normal models have hundreds or thousands uh, of entries, and they work. So our clients see on average about a 15% approval lift with no increase in risk uh, when they implement models on our platform. And some of our clients have chosen, instead of taking it to approval, rather to take the benefit to reducing loss. Uh, and we have one client who saved more than $100 million a year in losses. Um, because ML works, it just, I, I, it, just, it just does. And it works for all kinds of reasons, but notably, it works because it can use more data because it can handle cases where the person has, say, missing data on their credit bureau. So think thin file, think millennial, think immigrant. And it can handle cases where the person has erroneous data on their credit bureau. So think identity theft or any number of other situations which cause erroneous data. Traditional underwriting struggles in all three of those cases. ML works well in all three of those cases. But it's not free. 
Robert Heinlein quote, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Tan Stoffel. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch in this case either. You pay something to get the benefits of, I can't imagine a worse thing than waiting for your turn and like having to sit down neatly on chairs in the corner. Like, I mean, this is, so, I'm, I'm sorry guys, I'll shut up so you can get up here. <laughs> um, no, I won't. I <laughs> Uh, you pay for it in, in the form that machine learning algorithms are black boxes. When I look at, when I do a, an underwriting based on logistic regression, I know what's important. I just read the, I just read the coefficients, right? Logistic regression is y equals mx plus b. I just read the m's. The big ones matter, the small ones don't. Not that hard. In the case of a machine learning model, many kinds of machine learning model, there is no regression equation with coefficients, and the final equations are meaningless to understand. Now, you probably don't care why in Google Maps, if it tells you to turn left to the next corner, you probably don't really care why it made that decision. And if it's slightly wrong, you probably don't, you still probably don't care. Um, you know, it's not a high stakes decision, it's a low stakes decision. And there's lots of low stakes decisions every day. But for high stakes decisions, notably lending, it's a moral right, if not a legal right, to understand what made that decision and why. I'll go back in a minute to the, to, the, to the legal side of it, but let's dwell in the moral side of it for a minute. When you have the power to change someone's life, you should explain to them how you chose to do it or not to do it. It's part of being a good citizen, being a good human. That's very hard to do in ML. Uh, so the whole topic of machine explainability is, is quite hot right now. You can find a lot of newspaper articles and regular articles uh, on, the, on the topic. Um, the problem is almost all of them are wrong and almost all the solutions that are available in the market today don't actually work. There's a large number of reasons why, but the core problem is to explain a complicated model is a mathematically very hard thing. Uh, so one of the most effective ways of doing explanation, uh, facing a 100 signal model, requires you to run a model 10 to the 157th times. That is a very big number. For context, there are 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe. So probably you're not gonna explain that model with 10 to the 157th invocations. You're gonna do something else, and there are better answers. But the first question when you're thinking about ML or being sold ML, you need to say is how, how do you justify, how do you explain, how do you render your black box models white box? And then the second question is are you one of the people doing a technique which actually doesn't work? Sadly, most people aren't. But one of the things that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is what are the, what is kind of a regulatory slash legislative view of ML that would make sense? I mean, obviously at Google, we tried really, really, really hard to never reveal anything about how we ranked web pages. Uh, and we were almost, you know, almost you know, reflexive about it. And the reason was, if I had revealed, here's how we ranked web pages, the folks building spam web pages would have built better spam. Um, so our notion was, if we don't reveal it, we'll slow them down. Maybe true, maybe false, don't know. Um, you know now, uh, as I look at as for our, our mechanisms for explainability, I'd rather not talk about them publicly because they will give a, a leg up to, to competitors. Maybe true, maybe not, I don't know. But regardless, it kind of doesn't matter. But let's, if you think through what is required transparency for an ML model? There are sort of four parts of the world, right? Everyone has, in my opinion, the moral and should have the legal right to see and expect and comment on any piece of data that's input to any model about you, right? You should get to see that. Because clearly, ultimately, you're the source of that data through some number of intermediaries, granted, but like you did something which yielded that data, you should get to look at it and comment on it. That data should be fed into the machinery of a, a machine learning model. I don't think you have the right to see the machinery, but I do think you have the right to expect that uh, a lender following uh, this machine learning process would use uh, kind of a really, really detailed model risk management. We've all learned how to do that since 2008. We're much better at it. But those concepts of model risk management, of monitoring, of judgment, et cetera, should be applied to all ML models. And finally, in the event that you get a negative decision, you deserve the right to be told about it. Basically, it's just adverse action, right? ML adverse action, that's sort of three. And on top of that, you have regulators who should have the, the right to see all three parts uh, in behalf of their safety and soundness missions. 
ultimately, machine learning should be regulated like everything else. And I know that it's odd for some Silicon Valley person to say regulation is useful. I know we're all supposed to wear hoodies and be libertarian. Um, but I, I, I went to public school. <laughs> I, I, I turned out I like governments. Um, and I think ultimately we need a structure for guiding the next generation of what I consider the most high stakes decisions that we make in our lives, which are financial services. Thank you so much for listening. All right, lots to chew on there. That was good. Our next speaker is Dixon Chu. Dixon Chu has 25 years of experience working at the intersection of financial services, fintech, and customer integration. Um, he's currently the global head of portfolio management at BBVA. Um, he previously worked at uh, Wells Fargo, Yahoo, PayPal, and Citi. Um, he currently serves on the board of multiple uh, emerging technology companies. All of those are uh, within BBVA's uh, fintech portfolio. Uh, with that, uh, welcome Dixon Chu. Okay, note to self, don't go after Douglas. Um, so, five minute TED talk, that's a high bar. Um, and I have slides, uh, but I reduced it to three. I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking about what we care about at BBVA, give you some examples of things that we're doing um, around the world, around the theme of providing access, and then leave you with a parting thought. So, you know, I could wow you of all kinds of stats and facts about who we are and so forth, but you know, our leadership deeply cares about a couple of things. One of which is, for years and years, we've been inspired by technology. We look on the outside and say, wow, all these FinTechs, are they just gonna eat our lunch? Banks are gonna go away, what should we do about it? And over the years, we've realized, well, you know, actually there's a great role for banks. There's a reason to actually figure out how to coexist in an ecosystem. So let's come back to what, what we care about. And ultimately, we've been inspired by how technology really has provided access, right? Provided independence, provided mobility, and all that equals technology equals opportunity. And so with that, a few years ago, we went through a whole process as, as you would imagine with armies of consultants and so forth. But at, at the end of the day, the leadership came back and said, you know, let's talk about our purpose. Let's not worry about strategy and tactics and programs and initiatives. And ultimately, this is what drives 140,000 people around the world at BBVA. Our purpose is to bring the age of opportunity enabled by technology to everyone. So much so that that is now part of our brand, creating opportunity for BBVA. There's the lockup there. Now, of course, that sounds kind of fluffy. I'm from California, but you know we're a Madrid-based bank. Um, but everyone in the company deeply cares about this. Well, how do you put that into action? Of course, we have strategic pillars, right? We want to create the best user experience possible for, for our, our clients, our customers, and then for the world at large. How do you interact with your money? How do you interact with the bank? How do, you, how do you help yourself? How do we provide you the enabling capabilities? Of course, we want to be able to move things to, to and behave like a fintech, right? We're, we're a bank trying to be a technology company, so we're driving progressively um, more and more of our sales through digital channels, straight DIY, do it yourself, all the way through, no human touch. Um, we've been year over year increasing that volume by 20, 30, 40% year over year, and it continues to accelerate. So we're feeling, we're feeling pretty good about that. I'm gonna jump around a little bit. That then gives us, hopefully, an unrivaled efficiency in terms of our operations. So these are all pillars of, of, of what we think will get us to enable our purpose. Um, with that, well, of course, we're a bank, so optimizing capital allocation. And then at the end of the day, it's really about people. So you gotta get the right people in place. We're constantly looking at building the workforce and rebuilding the workforce. And lastly, we need to be able to compete. So there are all these exciting FinTechs, Douglas being you know, at Zest, one, one of them. 
well, we think we can do a few things as well. So we created a, um, a unit that I'm part of that I help run called New Digital Businesses, and so we're exploring that. So this is really high level. You're probably, you probably came to hear about, well, where's the stuff? What kind, of, what kind of things are you doing? Where are the programs? What are the initiatives? So let me give you a, a taste of what we're doing in the area that I, that I, I have some, uh, um, some responsibility for. Let's see if we can advance this slide. Ah, it does go the other way. Okay, so new business models. Um, we kind of a three-pronged strategy. We've been fairly acquisitive around the world, and so we bought a few neo banks, people who are doing really interesting things um, that we aren't going to get to very fast, and they're doing it quickly, and so let's learn from them. So we own a few banks around the world plus some payments companies. The first one was here in the States. We bought it about four years ago, Simple, based out of Portland, probably the first kind of neo bank on mobile. Um, and it's about getting access, right? How do we get to consumers that actually just want to interact with their money and their financial institution, not by going to a physical place, not by calling someone, but on their phone or on the web. Uh, we have a payments company down in Mexico. Um, um, we have a super exciting bank that we, uh, we have a big investment in, in in the UK called Atom. So here's a little fact for you about Atom. So they, they are a bank, licensed in the, in the UK. Um, they only sell three products. They have a time savings account, or what we hear what we call a CD, right? One, three, five year savings vehicle. They, they're aggressive about pricing, so they're getting share. They sell consumer mortgages. For those of you that know lending, mortgage is probably one of the more complex products to, to do out there. Um, and they sell small business loans, secure small business loans. That's all they do. Now, but they'll do more in the future. Um, but guess what? It's only on mobile. They do no advertising. Um, and in their first year of operation, they were able to amass um, over a billion pounds of consumer mortgages just on a mobile device. But that's not so astounding in some ways. The really shocking thing is everyone thinks tech, mobile, is a millennial thing. Guess what? Their average customer is 56 years old, depositing 27,000 pounds. Those are great numbers, and we're seeing it continue to grow. So that's an example. We also, at the same time, we think we've got some game. So we're incubating new businesses as well. So we have a number of ventures. We've got a business that's, um, that's all about thinking about new, new um, fraud models using AI and machine learning for providing unsecured uh, working capital to small businesses, that's, uh, that's TrustU. We have a, um, a small business bank that's purely on mobile here in the US that's trying to redefine what, um, what banking small business and entrepreneurs is all about. Um, and then we have an API marketplace. We're basically creating a bank as a service. We're taking our capabilities, exposing it to the outside world, and letting fintechs participate and, and flow, through, flow through us. Um, and then we have a venture, um, we have a venture um, arm, Propel Venture Partners, and they're, uh, they're an SBIC, totally independent, but it gives us another peek at really early stage development, and they're out there making their own decisions about FinTech investments. So I sit on the board of um, most of these companies, and I get an interesting view, and I provide active advice and all that. So that's a little bit of a flavor of, well, what are we doing about access? We're trying to provide access to small businesses, really hard segment. We're providing access to um, consumers that just want to interact differently. Um, we're providing access to expats. So one of our companies, Denison, that just launched, they're creating a global account targeting at uh, 80 to 100 million expats around the world. And we're not talking about the iBanker from the UK working in New York. There are literally millions of people who are, who are actually cross-border, have two homes, they're working where, not where they live or where they came from, but they have relationships and they need an ability to be able to interact with their money in a seamless way as if they were local. Um, so some, some, some examples of that. So I will stop there, come back to the idea of purpose. If our purpose ultimately is to create to bring the age of opportunity to everyone, it's gonna come back to execution. And for us, execution is entirely about culture, right? It's not about 
do I have a better strategy? Did McKinsey or BCG or whoever we pay millions of dollars to to give us some advice, even though it's incredibly valuable, don't get me wrong. Um, but that's great, that's a stack of paper. How do you actually flow that through? Because some, these companies will come and go, and the strategies will come and go, but ultimately what's enduring is culture, and in our, in our way of thinking, culture equals purpose, people, and people armed with the right values. And so that's what we're about, because at the end of the day, I think Peter Drucker had it right a few years ago. It's just a little bit delayed. So much for the punchline. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dixon. Our next speaker is Ed Cablet, and Ed Cablet has spent the majority of his career dedicated to the development of the payments industry. Um, he's a 25-year veteran of a company called Wells Fargo. You might have heard of it. Um, he's currently executive vice president head of uh, a deposit products group. Um, he's responsible for the overall management of uh, Wells Fargo portfolio under that. And what I think is interesting is when you think about um, your first uh, entry into the banking system, it's really under the products that Ed has um, um, uh, ownership over. Uh, so very interested in to hear his thoughts on um, financial access and that first entry into the system. Ed. Thank you, Allison. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here to share some of my perspectives about how we can uh, enhance access to the financial services system through innovation. As I was thinking about some of my remarks for today, I thought I would take a step back in time in my career in a moment that stood out. So it was in the early 90s in Norman, Oklahoma in July, and it was hot. So, and it's a time that I'll never forget. I was in a group talking, about 300 or so, talking about debit cards of all things. And you gotta think back in time, you know, for you, those that have been around a while, there really weren't any debit cards back then. Wells Fargo, which was, I was at Norwest at the time, we were the first bank to issue a debit card in the early 90s. And so I was in this audience talking about debit cards and I had an individual raise their hand. And he said, well, if, if it's your job to manage debit cards, good, good luck with that, number one. I, I, we don't see that product going anywhere, and we can't understand why anyone on earth would want a debit card. So I, I thought about that, and I said, well, there, there are actually four reasons why someone would want a debit card. Number one, maybe they don't have access to credit. They weren't able to get a credit card, or they don't have open to buy. Number two is convenience. It's way more convenient than cash and check. And remember, this was mail order, phone order was fairly hot back time, at that time. It was way before internet shopping. But you just couldn't write a check for a mail order or a phone order and, and expect to get goods and services on a timely basis. You know, the, the third was the area of control. People like the debit card because they were only spending available funds. You know, they, 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 want, they didn't trust themselves to get a bill at the end of the month from their credit card to be able to pay it off in full. And then last was safety and security. They liked the idea of having a plastic where they had Reg E protections, and if they lost it, they knew that they were covered versus a cash and a check. And so as I thought about it, and this was over 25 years ago, some of the same issues are actually in play today. You know, we're still interested in, you know, providing access. We're still interested in providing convenience, control, safety, and security. So what I wanted to do is spend a little bit of time talking about what Wells Fargo has been doing here recently, you know, to help address those particular topics. In the area of access, let's talk a little bit about uh, checking accounts. So our, our strategy there is to really provide an array of services and make them affordable to everyone. And we make them affordable by what we call getting a customer to primary status. And, and what that means is that the customer is using that product for their everyday needs. So uh, we charge a monthly service fee on our accounts but over 90% of our customers don't pay a monthly service fee because they're able to meet one of the criteria to have that fee waived, whether it be 
direct deposit or whether it be a balance or whether it be you know, debit card use, it's all ways to waive. The second product that we have is in the area of opportunity checking. Opportunity checking was a service that we developed for those that really had financial missteps in the past and they didn't have a way to get to a traditional or standard checking account. So the thing that's exciting is that we've had this product for a while, but late last year we actually made it available where it could be opened digitally. And we have found tremendous success with that. The third is in the area of what we call our Easy Pay card. So Easy Pay is a prepaid card that we worked on with the uh, Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund and the bank on 2.0 standards. So it's a product that we had certified according to their standards within the market, and we're finding a number of customers that are having success and enjoying that particular product. Let's talk a little bit about you know, the area of convenience and control. So um, we just launched last November a service called Overdraft Rewind. And it, it was actually a fairly straightforward concept, but the, the way it works is, you know, we know a customer has a direct deposit that's going to be coming in. And so what we do is we actually take a look at that direct deposit. Let's give you an example. So let's say the direct deposit is coming on Friday morning. We do our processing Thursday night. We actually take that deposit Friday morning and we go back and we recalculate overdraft and NSF fees. If the customer has that covering direct deposit, those fees are no longer assessed. So it's a way of using data, knowing the customer, and being able to rewind based on what we know on the customer and make a different decision. Since November, we've, had, we've assisted over 800,000 customers that have had a waivers, that, that have had an opportunity to have their overdraft fee waived. We also launched uh, last year um, zero balance and low balance alerts. It's an intraday service that if the customer you know, if the customer's account reaches a low balance threshold that they establish, or if it goes negative, we'll do an, uh, an alert intraday. And we use you know, intraday items like ACH and in clearings and so forth, so it's, it's near real time. On a, month, on a monthly basis, we, have, we send out over 20 million alerts to customers, giving them an opportunity to make a covering deposit that day in order to avoid an overdraft or NSF that night. So those are some examples of what we're doing around uh, you know, convenience and taking data and, and, and helping customers make better financial decisions. Another area that we have, are working on is a service called a Greenhouse by Wells Fargo. Greenhouse is a mobile only service that's intended to offer um, a variety of financial management tools and controls to help customers manage their money. It's a digital only account, it's in pilot right now, and you'll be hearing more about that uh, in, in the weeks to come uh, as we bring that to market. And then, um, and finally, uh, we have a new service coming out that I'm really excited about called Control Tower. And you may have heard our CEO, Tim Sloan, talk about this. What, what Control Tower does is it really provides a go-to place in a mobile experience to help you manage data, recurring payments, um, and just an overall accessibility. So what do I mean? Let's give, go through some examples. How many people have recurring payments, either ACH or on their credit card? Okay. So that will be a go-to place where you can go and manage those recurring payments. The other thing that we do is some might use some FinTech services where you push data out to those fintechs. We've actually created a secure data exchange with those companies to make sure data is being transmitted on a secure basis. That will be your go-to place to manage that information on a go-forward basis. The other area that I'm excited about is provisioning with wallets. So a number of our customers use a variety of wallets. They might use Apple Pay, they might be using a Google, uh, they might be using a Fitbit or a Garmin or whatever. This will be the go-to place where you have an opportunity you know, to manage you know, those devices that have been provisioned. So it, what we're trying to do is create a one-stop shop for customers with the data that we know about them and put them in control uh, of their financial lives. So we're excited about that. You'll hear more about that again in the, in the weeks to come. But these are examples of what we're doing in providing access, convenience, and control 
and safety and security. Let me just talk just briefly about safety and security because there's been some talk about AI. And uh, when we talk about security, I, I think this is a huge opportunity. We're, we're investing a, a lot of money in terms of fraud and authentication controls. And really the crux of that though is what we've got going in AI. And the ability to not only, if you think about how this worked traditionally, it was very product or channel focused, right? You looked at your phone center, you looked at your credit card, or you looked at um, a branch. And AI is giving us the opportunity to connect all of these dots and to help understand a full customer relationship to help by knowing them better to help protect them in the future. So we're really excited about what we're doing in the innovation space to help our customers succeed financially. Um, again, I appreciate the opportunity to spend time here with some opening remarks and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. All right, our concluding speaker in this section before we bring everybody back up for Q&A is Jay Bott. Uh, Jay Bott is the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Breakout Capital, uh, which is a nationwide online small business lender. Um, at uh, Breakout Capital, he uh, has brought more than 10 years of experience uh, from uh, marketing for uh, healthcare companies. Uh, so he worked at WebMD, GlaxoSmithKline, and Viscera. Uh, and he has a ton of um, interesting perspective that he can bring to this topic on digital marketing. Um, and so with that, please welcome Jay Bott. Thank you, Allison. Uh, that's right, I'm, I'm in, coming from healthcare, so anyone with more than five to 10 years of finance experience is smarter than me. Uh, but why am I here? Uh, so as Allison mentioned, Breakout Capital, we are a three-year-old uh, nationwide online lender, uh, but we were founded for an actual reason other than just lending to get money plus interest back. Uh, our, our founder uh, and CEO, Carl Fairbank, worked in the investment banking space for 10 years, and during that time, uh, he was actually banking in the alternative lending space. He noticed a lot of practices that were going on that were harmful to small businesses, um, and he felt that there's got to be a better option out there. That was literally it. There's got to be a better way. He presented options, no one listened, so we started Breakout. Um, I'm employee too, so I've been there from the beginning. You're probably wondering why would a healthcare guy be coming into the crazy world of finance? Well, the, the, the reason is simple. Um, our approach to online lending for small businesses is through transparent and innovative lending, strategic applications through advanced technology and education and advocacy. Um, I'm not our CTO and I'm not our general counsel, so I'm not gonna get too far into our machine learning and AI that we're getting involved in, and I'm probably not gonna get into a lot of the regulations that are going on. Uh, but when it comes to transparent and innovative lending, this was really the key. How many online lenders out there or cash advance companies are being truly transparent for small businesses? Let me put it another way. Let's try and go across to Dunkin' Donuts and I'll challenge someone to try and explain interest rate versus APR to that franchise owner in under maybe a minute on a phone call that you have. That's the challenge that small businesses have, is that they're making financing decisions without knowing as much as all of you know in here. And that's harmful for potential predatory online funders to come in and hidden fees, junk fees, double dip, uh, encourage stacking, basically putting a small businesses in debt cycles. And those are all things that Carl and Breakout and I am all very passionate about making sure that we are doing what we can do to improve access uh, for small business borrowers. Uh, when it comes to transparent, innovative lending, rather than just saying we're doing it, uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about how we do it for each. Um, our huge mantra is educate, innovate, um, uh, and advocate, uh, but really, it, it really starts with the innovate. Uh, a lot of times, innovation in our space leads to hey, you know, uh, apply now and get a response within a minute, receive funding within 24 hours. Great, how is that helping out the franchise owner at that Dunkin' Donuts? Yes, they might have access to capital quicker. Is it more expensive? What else is going on with technology to improve actual working capital? And so what we've done and, and what we've implemented are a few different innovative products that might sound pretty straightforward and basic, but in the online lending, alternative lending space wasn't happening. Uh, when we started in 2015, I'd say 90% of almost you know, all cash advances or loans were probably daily or weekly payments. 
Uh, we came out with a monthly product. We found a way, you know, using technology and, and using our underwriting to understand that there are certain businesses that are a little bit more up the ladder that we can offer a monthly payback period. This might sound something small, but if you're the franchise owner of that Dunkin' Donuts and someone's drawing from your account every day as opposed to just doing a monthly, it means the world. Right now, we do over 60 or 70% monthly payback schedule. And the space is moving more towards weekly and more towards month monthly, and that's a great thing for small business borrowers. Um, in understanding the small business tendencies for machine learning, a lot of that has to do with a lot of the back-end work that we're, that we're working on that's helping with a new product that we've rolled out called Factor Advantage. And Factor Advantage is, is a way to lend to small businesses that are factoring. It's something that has never really been discussed. It's never really been explained. It's all just apply online. But we're trying to find new, innovative ways to do that. So by working with factoring companies and working with their small businesses, we're finding solutions to what does that mean? So we're able to lend, but we're able to lend at a lower rate, and we're able to work with them to make sure that any liens or any issues that they have that the factoring company might have working with them are cleared. Uh, the last one, and I'm sure you all can't read it, uh, it says graduation programs to lower rate products for the SMBs. Uh, tied to that is what we really founded everything on when it came to uh, receiving applications, and that's what we call our suitability tests. Uh, it's not a test, it's not a quiz, there's not five questions, it's not 10 questions. It's literally part of our philosophy of what are we, how are we doing things? Um, we'll get an application. Our responsibility, Breakout's responsibility, is to make sure that if we are borrowing, we're borrowing because it's the right for the small business borrower. We get an application coming in from the franchise owner at Dunkin' Donuts. If we are lending, does it make sense for that owner? Are they able to borrow, pay back, and grow their business and reach their objectives? What is it that they're looking for? Are they looking just for a one-time because there's just a one-off situation? Or are they looking to graduate and get, get to a bank loan? That's the type of test that we run to understand what it is that the borrower needs. And we feel like that's something that's missing in this space. There's too many, you, you know, you need a, we need a response within an hour, or you need to make a decision within a certain time frame, or the money's not gonna be available for you. Or more importantly, if, you're, if you have a small business that's borrowing over and over again, and I'm sure all of you know small businesses will need to borrow over time, uh, some of the practices that go on is, is just debt cycling, keeping them on that high interest rate or that high factor rate, but charging interest on top of interest. And that's double dipping, and that's something that we're all extremely passionate about, and it's part of our whole education process. But by exposing that, it's allowing us to make sure that we're able to graduate folks to a cheaper term, or even if it needs to be, you know, to another online lender with cheaper products, or our goal really is, is an SBA loan or a bank loan. We're not trying to keep people on our books, and that's typically different from a lot of the other online lenders who try and keep folks on their books for as long as they can. Well, if the acquisition cost is so high, why would we want to do that? Well, our goal is to make sure that small businesses are getting what they need correctly. And so we've worked with a lot of other online lenders to make sure that they have access, you know, that our small business have access to work with them through us uh, if they're the right fit. And vice versa, you know, we all work in different credit boxes, so we're able to share through there. So through these partnerships, we're finding that, you know, it's not really affecting customer acquisition. And most importantly, just feedback and response that we get from our partners, um, from the industry, and especially from our small businesses, that they're happy to finally work with someone that's trying to focus on what's doing right for them. Uh, just going back to the education component, uh, there's a lot of APR calculators out there. I uh, won't spend a lot of time on this. We, we created one that has a daily, weekly, and monthly tab. So if you're a small business, you can go right onto our website and do that, and a lot of brokers use it. I'll speak to brokers in a moment. Um, we have a double-dipping calculator. We actually created a working, usable calculator to actually help you understand the impact that double-dipping has, and it's astronomical. And, that's probably worth a whole different session on its own, so I won't get into it. But we also created a blog series that are literally, you can print them out, small businesses have printed them out. It's basically questions to ask. Questions to ask to know whether or not you're making the right decision for your small business. Uh, and lastly, from, from the advocacy side, we're a member of the Innovative Lending Platform Association, and we are one of the early adopters um, of the Smart Box. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with the Smart Box, uh, in the finance world, they like to compare it to the Schumer box. 
Uh, in the healthcare world, I like to compare it to the prescribing information and important safety information box. Um, it's really a way, it's a uniform disclosure model. It's a way for someone who might not know everything about finance to take a shot and have the best opportunity to make the right decision for them. It is something that we believe in that it doesn't need to be only factor rate, only interest rate, only APR. What else is there? Cents on the dollar. There's a million things um, that, that you can use it. And in our case, we don't care. What is a small business owner? What, what do they care about? What's important for them to understand the cost? Is a factor rate fine? Is it APR fine? And there's a lot of arguments about APR, whether or not that should be necessary for products that aren't truly loans or that aren't uh, over a year long. Um, if, if, if a small business borrower is borrowing once, you know, for six months, it's the responsibility of that company to fully explain why that case is, why the APR is high, the fact that they're not borrowing for a certain amount of months over the year, uh, in plain English, and not, not using a lot of terms that make it difficult for them. Uh, at the same time, if a small business is borrowing for, say, eight months, and then you know they're going to borrow six months into that loan, and it's going to keep extending and now it's year over year, potentially there is a case for, for at least le letting them know what the you know, inferred APR would be on the original, or using what the interest rate is, or whatever else that they need. Uh, the way that we're set up, um, our sales department isn't, they're not in sales. They're, they come from finance. They come from the banking world, or they come from the investment banking world, so that they can explain things in terminology that's easy for the small business. That's where I come in. They'll sit in a meeting and talk for an hour about things that I, quite frankly, I, I, I don't want to hear it because it doesn't make sense to the small business borrow. And it's my job to make sure that what we're doing and what we're explaining makes sense to that small business. And that's absolutely critical. And if we're talking about improving access, um, especially in the small business space, we need to make sure that they know what they're getting themselves into. Some of the challenges that we face, uh, the first one is stacking in debt settlement companies, stacking, just obviously taking loans on top of loans or funds on top of funds. And, and our biggest concern is we, we don't allow it on ours um, and we will never stack another company. We know that it's, it's one of the challenges in our space, a lot of times for brokers who are just trying to fund another deal, uh, but we also know there's a lot of other funders out there that just focus in the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth positions, and it's dangerous to the small business because those funders are not underwriting for the, for the health of that small business. They're underwriting just to say, can they pay us back? Can we get our money out quick? Great. In my mind, shame on them. If they're not evaluating whether or not that small business can actually grow or achieve whatever their goals are, to me it's a failure and it's harmful and it's a practice that we believe needs to stop. Uh, there's a lot in MCA oversight uh, with, with cash advances and that the way that they're structured. Um, I won't get too far into that, but we know that there's, uh, uh, there, there's, there's quite a bit there that differs from, from lending that needs to be discussed. Uh, and a lot of it leads to debt cycling, which I spoke about. Um, the smart box, we, we're using it and we haven't had a small business yet say, I'm, I'm annoyed that you're giving me uh, explainers. I'm annoyed that you're helping me understand this. We never get that. If anything, sometimes that's why borrowers want to work with us. Uh, we, we're, I personally would like to see the, the smart box be used universally and it be something that's used across the board because it's that impactful and uh, there isn't anything else better yet to help small businesses fully understand it in a uniform disclosure uh, tool. And then federal oversight, I'm not gonna speak about that because I'm not on the legal side and I'm looking at our head of the ILPA and he knows how much I will avoid doing that because I wanna focus on make sure that, you know, and, and ensuring that uh, small businesses um, have the tools that they need uh, to grow, that we are doing our job in product innovation uh, and continuing to challenge the market and try with new ideas uh, in order for small businesses to have different ways to borrow uh, while being, um, you know, responsibly lent to, uh, while they have the ability to grow. That's it. Thanks. I invite everybody else back on stage, Dixon and Ed and Douglas. We've got about uh, eight minutes here for a little bit of Q&A. So before I ask a question, I'll go to the audience first. 
Does anybody from the audience have a burning question they'd like to ask? Yes, right here. This microphone is coming right over to you. This is um, directed at uh, all of you, but uh, primarily those uh, focusing on the small business side. So do you see any particularly particular regulatory barriers that have to be reformed or somehow modified? And currently, uh, what else do you need to see need to change? Since a couple years ago, I brought up this question about how long it takes for, it could be, a lend, it could be lending or even payments in general to be approved. And a couple days, they mentioned there's some regulatory issues with KYC and all that. So are there any of those uh, regulatory uh, reforms somehow? take a stab. I, I, I don't necessarily see it as a regulatory barrier, as I see as really a technology and data issue. So I think, I think the things that we run into in small business, let's say in a digital account open, getting the right records you know, about that business, getting it on file, doing the identity validation, I think we're making great strides in that particular area. So I think that's more about technology and innovation than I think it's about regulatory issues. Yeah. Um, not, not from, uh, I'll, again, I'll take it from the borrower standpoint and from the, you know, from, from the lender's funder standpoint. Uh, there's, there's talks about, you know, APR caps or interest rate caps in certain states and a lot of them are in place. Um, I'm not saying what they should do, but I will say that if there were more responsible lenders that would help small businesses improve their terms, graduate to better rates, and get them off of their books and get them to bank loans or SBA loans, uh, it'd be easier to understand why sometimes the APR interest rate is high because of the credit box and risk there is, but we're gonna work with the small business to improve their standing to get them to a cheaper rate. Can I actually ask a jump off question from that that relates to the regulatory piece of this? So um, you're talking about there should be more responsible lenders in the market, and during your comments you uh, alluded to that there were some perhaps unscrupulous actors in the space. Um, to buttress his question of what regulatory framework needs to be put into place, do you think that everything is there, or do you think that the online small business lending industry can come up with a set of principles or standards that could act as a best practices guide um, in lieu of having regulators step in uh, and have more space, or is all of this unnecessary and the bad actors just need to be weeded out under current rules? So the, the hard part is that the way that the bad actors are the bad actors is so detailed and it's it's so difficult to explain in the weeds when the conversation's about larger things. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's just the way it is right now. And, and a lot of times the, it's in the details. Uh, it'd be great if there was some sort of uniform disclosure model that every lending or funding company used that would help explain. Oh wait, the smart box. Yeah, I think the smart box would be honestly <laughs> a great tool. It really would be. In case you didn't hear about the smart box. Yeah, <laughs> no, but, but it is. If, if you're asking, like, for, for, for yeah. some of the, 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 the unsavory folks, who d if they used it. Yeah. Uh, Douglas or Dixon, do you have any, any uh, feedback on that? No, I, look, I've always been of the opinion that um, regulators are actually very well-intentioned, but they're not well-informed. And so tying back to this question, what can regulators do? Get informed. There's a lot going on in terms of business models evolving, technology being introduced. Um, on the other side of it, and, and this is probably a Douglas thing more than anything else, for instance, we can't speed the time to the decision using technologies like machine learning and AI, but from a framework standpoint, that's really hard right now because from a regulatory standpoint, if you can't explain how you got the result, which is incredibly difficult in an ML environment, not impossible, but the science is also evolving, then you still have people reverting to old regression models and things that, because they can, they can then audit and track back to, well, here's how I got the result. Is it a better result? Not necessarily. Is it a faster result? Not necessarily. So it's not keeping up with the advances in science. So I guess I'm gonna be the, uh, the odd man out up here um, once again. So I think actually we're woefully short of regulation and regulatory structure uh, at the moment. I think we, uh, we don't agree on what the regulatory goals are. So we've had transparency mentioned, we've had sort of speed mentioned. Earlier I talked about access. So just amongst us, we don't agree about what the core regulatory goals are, which tells us that we have regulatory framework work to get done. Obviously the market can lead 
to good outcomes, that's true, can also lead to bad outcomes. And I think, you know, it's been kind of a, a tough quarter for Facebook. I think it's been a tough quarter for some prominent financial services organizations in each case where maybe, you know, having a good regulatory framework would have helped. Um, so no, I think we're, I think we're for short actually. So uh, maybe we, yeah. Just to add on to that, I, I think there are certain practices that definitely need some, some regulation around it. Uh, especially when it comes to whether it be double dipping or whether it be, you know, goes into stacking. I think there needs to be discussion there on, on what is crossing the line so far that it's small businesses won't be able to recover. Other questions? Yes, here. Someone had said, I don't have the right accent, right? So I hear there's, there's a lot that's happening around the world. Um, but are there countries that you think are actually doing it right or they're going down the right pathway that we should think more about? So I think looking at GDPR is a, is a great um, kind of useful counterpoint. Um, so GDPR starts, you know, we tend to, in America, we tend to regulate based on outcome and damage. Um, GDPR has a view of regulation that is about ownership and creation. So data is about you, you own it, you create it, thus you should have the right to do all kinds of things to it, uh, which is, uh, I think, interesting, but for what it's worth, I think quite hard to manage in any opportune way. It is extremely hard for the internet to forget, even if you get a Google button that says forget me. Uh, sadly, that's not the way the world works. Uh, and I think the notion that businesses are on their own and can use their own data, not share that data, not do third-party uh, contracts, I, I think those days are, are gone. Um, so I think the obvious answer to your question would be like, oh, hey, look, GDPR looks great because it's certainly thoughtful. Um, but I think rather we should say, what are the terms and what are the economic benefits and damages done by data moving around? So how many of you in this room have one of those club cards for your local grocery store? Please raise your hand. You're all selling your data for about a dime on average a transaction. And you don't care, you feel good about it. That's fine, right? Uh, it's okay, but you should get to the value of the data that you sell. Uh, I think if you can, if, if we could build a world in which we talk about data in transit as opposed to data at rest, I think would be far, far better. Sorry, long answer to a short question. <laughs> Just to build on that, I think the companion piece when you talk about GDPR is PSP2, right? And that's all about access. So banks are obligated to provide access via a set of APIs to, um, to their consumer's account by third parties who are requesting it. And I think those two things actually really need to go together. It's a step forward, I think. Um, and back to your question about, you know, is anyone doing it right? I, I think it's too early to say, but examples of uh, places like, the, uh, like Singapore and like the UK, where they're pushing open banking um, they've created regulatory sandboxes where you're going to remove um, the, the enforcement part of regulation away and create a, a, a safe harbor of sorts so that you're going to so that you can encourage marketplace innovation in, in a in a ring fence kind of way. I think we need that here. Um, I, I you know I, I I don't think we're short on innovation here at all, but um, there is there is definitely a lot of friction. Well, I want to keep us on track, uh, and so uh, we are going to move to the next session. Uh, I'm sure these guys will be happy to chat with any of you uh, after we get off stage. Uh, but this has been really fascinating, and I think the data and privacy thing could be an entire conference on its own. Uh, we plan to host another of these uh, FinTech Ideas Festival policy series October 10th, uh, and a good portion of that conference is going to be focused on data and privacy. Uh, so uh, obviously we welcome your insights. Uh, thank you to the panel, uh, and I'll turn it now over to Chris Feeney, who will introduce the next section.